Praise God. Father, we come before you thanking you for your goodness and your greatness and you being good. So, Father, we thank you for tonight that all will be done by your spirit. No flesh will be glorified. And, Lord, we declare that the seed of your word will fall on good ground, will take root and bring forth fruit that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. Now, Lord, we thank you that Christ will be exemplified, that our hearts and minds and we are being channeled and focused on Christ. We give you thanks. We give you praise for all that will be done by your spirit tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give God praise. He is worthy to be praised. You all may be seated in Jesus' name. And of course, starting off, I uh, want to give honor, as I always do, to Dr. Dollar and Pastor Taffy, always thanking them for the direction that they're taking the ministry and causing us to grow in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So we definitely honor them. Um, I want to, as always on the Wednesday night, just try to go ahead on and jump right into it. Uh, our time is, is pretty limited. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that we do is that we always uh, try to stay in, in, in the vein of what Pastor has been doing. I've been noticing some of the other ministers, they've been staying in the vein of Pastor ministering on the discomfort uh, and all. And really, when you think about that topic, there's a lot to talk about. There's, um, you know, I think we have missed it um, generally as the body of Christ when we talk about the suffering, discomfort, trials, tribulations, all of those things that are out there that have been happening to our lives, but oftentimes we were just kind of dismissing it as if, you know, it wasn't anything really that was, was going on. We act as if uh, we, we were, <laughs> it's almost like we were living the lie, you know? We, <laughs> all of us were going through stuff, but we were acting like, you know, as Pastor said, when you fall and, and, you know, hurt something, you jump up saying, that don't hurt, that don't hurt. Yeah, it, it does hurt. So these things are happening in our lives. But when we understand why they're there, when we understand uh, purpose in it, when we understand what's coming out of it, it helps us to endure these things. Any trials, any tribulations, there are going to be some that are destined in your life. There are going to be some that you bring on yourself, uh, <laughs> which the Bible talks about that. There are some that we bring on ourselves. It says, you know, if, if, we, if we suffer for wrongdoings, we've, we've kind of brought that on ourselves. But there are going to be things like that that are, that are happening in our lives. But turn to Matthew, the uh, sixth chapter and the 34th verse, and we'll read this in the in the message translation as we get ready to go and dive into this. And tonight I'm calling this from trials to glory, from trials to glory, praise God. Just because we're dealing with trials doesn't mean that we suffer, have to suffer and lay in them. Uh, there is, as I said, a purpose for them. We've got a, an outcome. God has a vision in mind. The Bible said, Jesus said, we are to consider him. And it said that consider Jesus who endured such contradiction of sinners. Then it says, and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So see, there's a joy that is set before us in the midst of all of our trials, all of our tribulations. We just gotta, we gotta look for it. We haven't been looking for it. There's a joy that is set before us. And if we can set our sights on that joy, then we can find ourselves breezing through the trials and the tribulations. See, there was something when Stephen was being stoned, the Bible says he had a face like an angel, but yet and still he's being stoned. And yet and still while he's being stoned, he looks up and he sees Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says, and he fell asleep. You see, see when you look at things through the, the portal of God, when you look at things the way God wants us to see it, when we change our focus, when we begin to now stop focusing on why me? Poor me. How come, how come this is happening? God, have I sinned? All, forget all that. No. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Amen? And for the joy that is set before him, he endured the cross. He saw the joy, and as he was going through the, 
uh, the beating as he was going through the nail on while he was dealing with the shame and all he was still looking at the joy what was the joy that he was seeing you being saved you being saved you being saved you being saved he saw that and he said I'll, I'll deal with that in order that they may come into the to the kingdom of God amen, amen. praise God so Matt so Matthew the sixth chapter and the 34th verse basically this is talking about uh, take no worry for, you know, or take no thought or take no worry for the things of life. And it ended with this particular verse. It says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen. <laughs> Man, folks are worrying about stuff. It's like, dude, it hadn't even happened. And yeah, but it might. And it might not. <laughs> so it says, don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever. Say whatever. whatever. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. When the time comes, God promises he's going to be there with us dealing with the hard thing that comes up in our lives. Now, let's, let's define trials, because as I was thinking about this, you know, I, I said, you know what, I think we think that trials have to fit this particular definition, trial and tribulation, and, and, and it does, but I'm going to add a little something to it. The definition of trial and tribulation, experiences or situations that test a person's faith, Endurance or self-control. Experiences or situations that test a person's faith, endurance, or self-control. Oftentimes we think, <laughs> and what got me on this, my wife said to me, she said, she said, you ever go through trials? I was like, I think I do. I'm pretty sure I do. She said, I don't ever see you suffering. <laughs> so I said, well, honey, trials doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go through a long duration of suffering. That is part of it. That's, that's part of it because you got a job. You know what I'm saying? You got, you got um, a situation where people may have prolonged illnesses or people may be dealing with an abusive situation, deal with that or or long financial hardship, those are, those are trials. Those are things that stretched out. But everything doesn't necessarily have to be stretched out. You can be in a situation of a, of a trial where you're tempted to lie. Oh, we, we don't see that as a trial, do we? You know, when you, when you still got to live, when you still got to demonstrate godly character, you know what I'm saying? And you're tempted to do that, but you're, you might be tempted to lie. You might be tempted to steal or, or cheat or something like that. Or it, it could be a temptation to enter into a one night, one night affair. That's a trial. Believe me, it, it'll turn into a trial if you get a kid out of this situation. <laughs> That's shown up going to turn into a trial. But it was real quick. It was quick. It just happened just that night. You know what I'm saying? But yet and still, that's a trial, that's a tribulation, that's a, that's a test that you have to go through, that you got to endure, that you got to uh, overcome. Or, you know, what about if you're dealing with an argument with your spouse? Married couples say, ouch. <laughs> I know y'all like, oh, we, we don't ever deal with arguments with our spouse. We don't have those things. But, or if you lose your cool, or some of y'all have been in a situation where you start, uh, you've lost your cool and you start cussing. You know, it's, that's all right. I'm, I'm going to change the subject in a minute, y'all. Y'all getting quiet on me, but it's all right. But that's, that's a test. That's a trial. Did you pass it? When you were tempted to cuss at that person who cut in front of you, did you pass that test? Did you pass that? That was a trial. It was quick. But did you pass it? And see, I was in a situation, Pastor told this, this story, but I'm going to tell you guys it tonight because I found myself in a trial just that quick. This happened about a month and a half ago. I was down in Destin with my grandsons, and we were down there playing in the water, and I got three grandsons. And, and so one of the oldest one, he was right there with me. You know, we weren't, 
we weren't going too far out. Basically, we just kind of went ankle deep. You know what I'm saying? We're, we were dealing with that. But my other two grandsons, they were out. They weren't too far out, and, but they were, they were playing in the water. And then as I looked up, I started to say to them, boys, come on in. You all getting too far out. Come on in. And as I looked up, one, there were two of them together. The youngest one started floating farther out into the ocean. And I mean, it was happening quick. Apparently, he got caught up in a current, and it was taking him out in the ocean. And as soon as I was trying to say, come on in, I looked, and they were, they were being separated like this. And the youngest one, he weighs about, you know, 50 pounds, maybe. But the ocean was taking him far out there. And you could hear him saying, help, help. And so I immediately sprung into action. It, it wasn't like a thought. I just, I started going out there. But you know, you know, you can't run through water. You know, you're struggling. So you're trying, I'm trying to get out there. And as I'm going, I tell the, the other one, get out the water. Because I don't want to have to try to save two, right? So it's like, get out the water. And I'm, and I'm going towards the kid. And as I'm going, he's getting farther and farther away. Ah, man, so, and I'm looking at him, and everything is happening like milliseconds, milliseconds. I mean, fast, 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 fast. And what's going through my mind is, Lord, don't let him go under. Because if he goes under, I don't know where he is. I, I can't get to him. And I said, Lord, don't let him go under. And I said, Lord, help me get to him. Help me get to him. And you all have been in water, and you know how water bobs up and down. So when it would bob down, I could touch the ground, and I try to push, try to get to him. And every time I'm swimming, when, it's, when I'm up, when it's down, I push and try to get to him. So he seemed like he kept getting farther and farther away. And I said, Lord, help me. Help me. And I kept doing that, and I got to him and I grabbed him and I pulled him to me and he did what any person would do. He was panicking and he grabbed me all around the head and I said, calm down. <laughs> I said, calm down. And I was ready. If I got to knock this kid out, I'm gonna knock him out cause I'm not gonna wrestle with him trying to get him, him back. But I said, calm down. And he calmed down immediately and he, he grabbed me around my shoulders and I looked and we were so far from the shore. And I'm thinking, you know the energy I had to expend to get out here. <laughs> now I got to spend that same energy trying to get back. But when I grabbed him and I said, calm down, and he calmed down, and I looked and I turned to shore, and I said, and I said pray to Jesus that he saves us. That boy started praying. Jesus, Jesus, save us, Jesus, Jesus, help us, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I thought he was tearing that altar, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he started calling on the name of Jesus. Oh, man. And uh, so we started, you know, started making our way back to shore, making our way back to shore. And, and he, was, he was praying to Jesus, and I'm praying to Jesus, and I'm thanking God, and and, and, we, and we got back to the shore. Praise and praise God. <laughs> but see, that was a trial for me. That wasn't something that was a long duration. That probably all happened in a matter of 15 minutes or so. But it was a trial. But during the trial, from trials to glory, what does the word glory mean? It means manifested word. From trials of your life to the word of God being manifested in your life, bringing you out of that trial. What was the word of God that was manifested? They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God manifested that in our lives. I said, call on Jesus. I pray. I said, pray to him that he saves us. And, and I mean, I was, every, as I said, everything was so quick. Everything was happening. I grabbed him. I got him. I said, calm down. And immediately turned around. I said, pray to Jesus that he saves us. 
And he started praying, and we're, we're trying to make our way back to the shore, and God got us back to the shore. But from trials to glory, do we trust him? When we're in those trials, what comes out? Because I'm telling you, I didn't have, at that time, what was in me was in me. I didn't have a time to try to act religious. I didn't have a time to try to act like, oh, I'm super Christian now. No, it's springing into action, trusting God, going out there doing it. What's in me comes out. Pray to God that he saves us. Lord, help me save this child. Help me. And what is it that we look at when we're in the midst of these trials? What is it that we look at when we're dealing with these situations? And I started thinking, I said, God, I said, you have been so faithful to me. Many of you all know about the situation about the accident in Sacramento 20 some odd years ago. I was the one who got thrown out of the vehicle as the vehicle was hit and tumbling like this and I get thrown out and I'm airborne and I land in the windshield of another vehicle only with a few cuts, only with a few cuts. But while that was happening, I had to close my eyes because glass shattered, so I didn't even see me being thrown out of the vehicle. I thought I was still in the vehicle. I had no idea I'd been thrown out. But while all of this was happening, I promise you, there was a peace on me like you would not believe. It was like, hmm. We're tumbling. Man, when are we going to stop? <laughs> That's what was going through my head. When are we going to stop? Okay, then it's like, bam. Okay, we stop. Then it's like, okay. You know, I can't really open my eyes because glass is all around my eyes and stuff. I knew if I opened my eyes, glass was going to get in my eyes, so don't do that. But I'm, I'm fine. You know, and pastor comes over and he says, Ken, you okay? Because he realized I'd been thrown out. He said, Ken, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, Ken, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, Ken, you okay? I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, yes, I'm fine. But I didn't realize that where I had been cut up on the hair made this look red because I had a white shirt on. So he thought I'm bleeding all around my neck. So he kept saying, Ken, you okay? I'm fine, I'm fine. But the peace of God that came over me in the midst of that situation, I'm telling you, when you're dealing with trials and when you're dealing with tribulations, can there be that faith? What's the definition here again I gave? Experiences or situations that test a person's faith. What's your faith? Do you believe him when you're going through it? When you find yourself happening and dealing with that, that situation, do you believe him when you're going through it? I'll give you another situation. I was driving. I had my family in the car, and we're driving on I-20 going, going west, and we're down there by uh, the AU Center, and all of a sudden, this car hits the big motor bus, and the big motor bus starts coming towards over into my lane, uh, uh, causing me to, you know, to, to turn over. But God, and I remember saying, Jesus, everything slowed down. It was like, whew. it was almost like a matrix moment. You know what I'm saying? It's like, because I was, I, as it started happening, I saw the bus coming, and I went, Then I saw that car, and I went, shh. Then I saw the other car, and I got back in that lane, and, I, and my son said, dang, Dad. It's like, man, how you do that? Boy, I don't know. <laughs> it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. But I'm saying, let's get prepared to where we find ourselves in these situations, we call on his name. Because they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And even if you're not able to call on the name of the Lord, just believe in him, just, just trust in him, amen? All right, so now let me, let me deal with this uh, real quickly. I want you to write these scriptures down. 
In Numbers 11, 15, this is pertaining to Moses. Just write Moses in Numbers 11, 15. Write Elijah, 1 King 19, 3. Write Job, Job 6, 8 through 9. Then write Jonah, 4th chapter and the 3rd verse. Now, media, I want you to work with me real quickly. We're just going to go through these scriptures. Because what I want you to see is that here are men of God. Go to uh, Numbers, the first, Numbers 11, 15, uh, media. And then get 1 Kings 19, 3 ready to go. These are mighty men of God. Elijah. Moses. Job. Now Jonah, eh. But still, these are, these are men of God. They were dealing with trials. And they were dealing with tribulations. And they were dealing with things that were hard in their lives like some of us deal with sometimes. But this is what they wanted to do. Here's the thing in common that they all wanted to do, but they overcame. If thou deal thus with me, this is Moses saying, kill me, I pray thee, out of, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see thy wretchedness. He wanted to die. Let's go to uh, 1 Kings 19.3. <clears throat> 1 Kings 19.3. And when he saw, when he saw that, he arose, this is Elijah, and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day earlier. I got that one wrong. I thought, that's, try 2 Kings, 2 Kings 19.3. Okay, I apologize, guys. I had my scriptures uh, mixed up. I'll find that scripture for you. But go to Job, the sixth chapter and eighth verse. Job 6, 8. Oh, that I might, oh, that I might have my request. Oh, that God would grant me the thing that I long for. Even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. And then go to Jonah. Jonah 4, 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, why do I want to share this with you? <clears throat> because it is understandable when things get hard that people want to get out. It's understandable that even great men of God, when they were dealing with situations wanted to bow out. But the thing about each and every one of these men of God is that things turn and they had a, they had a change in their thinking. They had a change in the way that they looked at things. They had a change in the way that they viewed things, whereas things were hard and pre pressing and they wanted to die, but yet and still they all ended up overcoming. We know what happened with Job. We know what happened with Jonah. We know what happened with Elijah. He ends up passing this mantle on to Elijah, uh, Elisha. Uh, and we know what happened with Moses. Moses delivered the people out of, out of the wilderness into the, into the promised land. So here you have these situations where people are dealing with hard times and want to give up and they want to cave in, they want to quit. But when we look at this and when we understand that we go from trials to glory, see at the time they couldn't see the glory that was set before them. At the time all they saw was the trial. At the time, they couldn't understand that God had a plan in place that he was going to deliver them and, and make them great in, in, in his own time. But at the time, they couldn't see that. So we've got to understand and begin to understand that we go from trials to glory. We go from trials to glory. Say that with me. We go from trials to glory. Now, let's go here to uh, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse. If we haven't noticed, when a believer goes through suffering, there's a biblical pattern that is carried out. And it is, you go from suffering to glory. There's a biblical pattern that is carried out. You go from suffering to glory. 
Paul says here, he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What do you call them? Light afflictions, which are but for a moment. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, <clears throat> excuse me. And we'll start, I think, in the 20, 22nd verse. 2 Corinthians 11, 20, 23. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more, more abundantly and strikes more often uh, above measure in prison, more frequent in death often. Of Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Let's stop right there for a minute. <laughs> he said five times I received 39 stripes. What's 40 times 5, 40? What's 40 times 5? Okay. <laughs> that means he received 196 stripes. Maybe not all at one time, but sometimes that might make it worse. It's like, you know how some of y'all dealt with punishment. It's like, come on, let's get it over. Don't, don't prolong it. Let's get it over. But he dealt with 196 stripes. Stripes. Next verse. Three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a deep, night and a day, I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils uh, by, my, uh, by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils by, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren in weariness and painfulness and in watchings often and in hunger and thirst and in fasting often, in cold and in nakedness. Besides those things which are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. Now go back to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse. Paul dealt with all of this. All of these things were happening to Paul but yet and still, in 2 Corinthians, the 4th chapter and the 17th verse, he says, for our light affliction. <laughs> Paul's on another plane. Paul's in another atmosphere. Paul's in a different mindset. Paul said, these are our light afflictions. He said, which is but for a moment. He said, they work in us. These afflictions are working in us. What are they working in us? They're working in us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. For these light afflictions. See, it's something about Paul understanding the way that I look at this thing will determine how I go through it. The way I focus on this thing will determine how I go through it. What I understand about this thing will help me to endure it when I'm going through it. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the 9th verse. We're familiar with this. But I want you to see how Paul is looking at afflictions and how he's looking at trials because Paul is saying, I'm going from trials to glory. When Paul looked at a trial, he looked at, oh, that's my avenue to glory. I said, when Paul looked at a trial, he said, that's my avenue to glory. Amen. When you're going through things, when we look beyond what we're dealing with and see the joy that is set before us, we find out that our trials are just light afflictions. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I know it's hard. Don't, don't get, I'm not trying to be dumb deep. I'm, I mean, come on, you get whipped 196 times? You think Paul didn't feel that? Of course he did. But I'm going to share something with you to let you know still how Paul's mindset is one that went from trial to glory. The apostles' one, mindset was one that went from trial to glory. When they were beaten by the high priest and all, they came out rejoicing, said, my goodness, we're worthy to be whipped for Jesus. Come, what kind of mindset is that? You look at those folks, you're like, man, y'all got to be, y'all must be, as, as Bishop Fuller said, y'all must be smoking that peyote or something. <laughs> but what kind of mindset is that? What kind of attitude is that? 
So he says here, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We've read this. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul now takes that and says, hmm, okay, I got to stop looking at things the way it's happening down here on, on the earth. I got to stop looking at things the way that I've been looking at. I got to take the complaining out. I got to take the griping out. I got to take the fear out. I got to take the worry out. I got to take all these things out. I got to take the depression out. I got to take the anxiety out. I got to take all this stuff out because I'm looking at it the wrong way when I leave those things in. So now when I find myself dealing with something, he says, God said, my grace is sufficient. My strength, God's strength, is made perfect in your weakness. He says, now, this is Paul with the mind shift. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I now rather glory in my infirmities. There we go, glory again. From trial to glory. Therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmity. That's why when you read over there where we were reading in 2 Corinthians 11, it actually precedes this particular chapter. He says, I'm being foolish by boasting. He said, you guys have put me in this position where you're going to make me have to boast. He said, I don't want to do it because I want to be humble about it. He said, but you're going to make me have to boast. And then when he started boasting, he started boasting about the things he had gone through and how God had brought him out of it. So he said, most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that what? The power of Christ may rest upon me. What infirmity are you dealing with? I assure you, if you let him, the power of Christ will rest upon you. What temptation are you dealing with? I assure you, if you let him, the power of Christ will rest upon you. What do you find yourself facing if you go into it with a mindset that Jesus would never leave me nor forsake me, I assure you that the power of Christ is resting upon you. Now, let me, um, let's go to 2 Corinthians, the uh, first chapter in the 8th verse. I want to read this in the New Living Translation. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. <clears throat> Praise God. All right, now, we're going to speed it up. We're going to speed it up here. Paul speaking about his situation. He says, we think you ought to know. I need to bring this to your attention, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. There's a big old butt here. There's a big old butt right here. He said, in fact, we expected to die. He said, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. So what he was saying here, even if we die, we ain't going to trip out over it. Why? Because we serve a God who can raise the dead. So whereas I'm fearing for life, I'm serving a God who is life. Takes a different mindset. Takes a different mindset. He said, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, now as a result of this, they started looking, they, they realized that we can't keep looking at this dire situation because now we're, we're, we're fearful, we're, you know, we're in dismay, we, we are uh, worried, we're dealing with all of this. But he said, as a result, we stopped. And then we started relying, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. So when you find yourself in whatever you're dealing with, 
Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You guys know that scripture. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able. But he will make a way of escape. He will make a way of escape. Now, think about that scripture. When I look at that scripture, I don't look at every trial and all as uh, God disapproving of me, but I look at it as him approving of me. Because it's like, okay, ain't nothing going to happen that I hadn't already defeated. That's not going to happen in my finished work. I got this thing all contained. Nothing is going to happen to Ken that I can't deliver Ken from, that Ken doesn't have the faith to believe me for, that Ken won't come out on the other end, that Ken won't win, win, win. Amen? We win, man. We win, we win, we win. All right, all right, so now let me share a few things with you. <clears throat> now, David w was dealing with Goliath. Your trials have a purpose. Your trials have a purpose. David was dealing with Goliath, and he came to Saul, and he told Saul, I can take care of this dude. And Saul's like, no, you're just a young boy. He's been fighting ever since you were a kid. You know, you, you're biting off more than you can chew. He said, no, I can take care of this guy. I'm telling you, I can take care of him. Why? Let's go to, let's go to 1 Samuel 17 chapter and the 34th verse. What would make David say that? What would make David say that? Because David's like, I've been through some afflictions. I've been through some trials. I've had some hard times. This ain't nothing compared to what I've gone through. This ain't nothing compared to what my God delivered me from. He said, Did this dude, it's like, man, this is, this is child's play for me. Because my God, and let's read this. But David persisted. He said, I have been taking care of of my father's sheep and goats, he said. He said, and when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it. <laughs> Y'all missed that part. <laughs> See, most folks would be like, oh, well, we just got one less lamb. <laughs> no, David said, uh-uh. He said, uh-uh. He said, I go after it. He said, I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. Man, y'all got to understand. Go home tonight and look at some YouTube videos and see how vicious lions are. They're not playing. I mean, they're ferocious. They're strong. They got teeth that'll, that'll just cut you to pieces. But David ran to them. Why? Because David trusts God. Next verse. He said, I've done this both, I have done this to both lions and bears. He said, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. I'll do it to him too. He said, for he has defied the armies of the living God. See, David knew who delivered him. David knew who brought him through that lion attack. David knew who brought him through that bear attack. He knew God delivered him, and he said, this uncircumcised Philistine, he can't stand against my God. So what am I saying here? When you've gone through trials, they have a purpose. They're preparing you. Don't back down. They're preparing you. See, your trial may be the lion. Your trial may be the bear, but he's preparing you for a Goliath. And I promise you, you'll win. <laughs> I promise you, you'll win. Hallelujah. So our trials have purposes. Now, 
we, we, we use this a lot, but there's a lot in it. The three Hebrew boys. Let's turn to Daniel. Daniel, the third chapter. There's a purpose in your trial. Your trials will take you from trials to glory. If you, if you let God do what he's doing in your life, it'll take you from the trial to the glory. That's the biblical pattern of these sufferings. It's not for you to stay in suffering. It's to take you from suffering to glory, from trial to glory. Remember, always, there, there's something that's set before you. Don't look at where you are now. Look at what's set before you. Don't get locked in what's happening now. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, it says here, so in, in, um, I didn't give where to go. Daniel, third chapter. I thought I did. Daniel 3, 5. Now, we know about the deal, the, the fiery furnace. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was mad. He told them uh, because they said, we're not going to serve your idols. We're not going to bow down. He, he said, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Uh, then he said, since you made me so mad, I'm going to heat it up even, you know, so many times hotter than it is supposed to go, even to the point that the people who were heating up the furnace, they died because it was so hot. <clears throat> All right, so now we deal with this. And Daniel uh, 3, 5, it says, when you hear the sound of the horn, the, the flute, the, all those things there, and the other instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar, the golden statue. Now, they said we're not going to do it. Let's go to verse 12, because I'm, I'm going to go through these real quickly. Verse 12. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you. Why? Because they knew that the commandment was, you shall have no other God before you. They knew that. So why am I going to bow my knee to this God when that will be putting this God before my God? They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, let's go to verse 20. Let's go to verse um, uh, 15. <clears throat> verse 15. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? You done messed up. <laughs> because now you're saying, my God, you, you said, what God? You done messed up because now you're getting my God involved in it. <laughs> you done messed up. <laughs> you are not the father. <laughs> Praise God. And he isn't the father. He's not the father of the Lord, father, our God. Amen. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Verse 16. Let's read on verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. I'm not going to beg you. The answer is a hard no. I'm not bowing my knee to you. Now, we know what happened, that they threw him in the fiery furnace. Shadrach, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar looks down and said, didn't we throw, throw three in there? Why do I see four? And the fourth looks like the son of God, or the son of man. And wait a minute, they're walking around in the fire. <laughs> and then he calls them out. And when they come out, they don't even have the smell of smoke on them. There's a purpose for your trial. Because let's read this in verse 28. Let's see what happened as a result of that. <clears throat> then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> he sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship 
any God except their God. Now, what ended up happening was Nebuchadnezzar, because I want to make a few, few more points, I'm going to just say this real quick. Nebuchadnezzar ended up changing his decree. And he said, if nobody, if people don't bow down and serve Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, they're going to be thrown into the fire furnace. But what if they would not have endured the affliction? What if they would not have stood their ground and trusted God? That wouldn't have happened. So what you're going through, there's a reason for it. When the people who were, to bring it to an earthly uh, analogy here of our time, when the people who were fighting in the civil rights thing, there was a reason that they had to go through what they had to go through. They weren't going to just change the laws because they were saying, would you? No, they had to go out and endure. Endure. All right, let's read this real quickly. Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel's in the lion's den. Daniel 6, 3. Praise God. Just real quickly, real quickly, real quickly. Daniel 6, 3. We're there? Okay. So Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the administrators and high officers because Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. People got jealous. People got jealous. All right, let's keep reading here. Let's go to verse 10. Verse 10, real quick. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open. Ain't hiding. <laughs> Towards Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Now, the decree was that you're not supposed to pray to any God during this particular time. Daniel was like, can't do that. Can't do that. I pray to my God three times a day. And I do this always. So you're not going to make me now stop serving my God because you put out a decree. Right. Verse 23. Verse 23. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Now, of course, the, the, the angel came in, shut the mouth uh, of the lion. They didn't do anything. Daniel was in there a whole night. Woke up next day, king came, came and said, Daniel, has your God been able to deliver you? And he was like, live on forever. My uh, king, my God has delivered me and brought me out of this situation. So the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Now the scratch was found on him, for he had trusted, there we go, he had trusted in the midst of the trial. He had trusted in the midst of the tribulation. He had trusted that the trial would go from a trial to glory. What's the manifest the word? God will deliver his people. What's the manifest the word? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver him out of them all. What's the manifest the word? Hey, if God be for you, who can be against you? What's the manifest the word? Greater is he that sent you than he that is in the world. What's the, what's the manifest the word? I am over, I'm an overcomer. What's the manifested word? Let it be manifested in our lives. Now, let's go on and just read on real quickly. Let's go to uh, 25 and 26. We're going to get ready to close out. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom shall tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never come to an end. I changed my decree. Why? Because Daniel wouldn't bow his knee. Why? Because Daniel say, I trust God in the midst of it. Why? Because Daniel knew that if I don't go through this thing, now keep in mind, why didn't God deliver Daniel before the lion's den? Why didn't he deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before the fiery furnace? Why didn't he deliver Jesus before the cross? Why was it that Paul had to go through all those things that we read? Why didn't he deliver them before that? There's a purpose for your trial. 
See, when you're going through it, focus on Jesus. See Jesus, see Jesus, and you'll see glory. Come on, let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you guys for your time. God bless you all. Amen. Give it up for Pastor Ken one more time. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for our Savior. Thank God for our Savior. That, that whole sermon just pointed directly at Jesus. And the trials that Jesus went through, none of us have to endure. But his trial that led to glory came down for us as well. And we should just be thankful. So if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life today, and you want to make him your Savior, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today admitting that I am a sinner. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. World Changers, would you give it up for those who just made that decision today? Amen. If you just prayed that prayer of salvation, I want you to text the key word as one word, I'm saved to 51555, and we will get you a free ebook today, and congratulations. It is gift giving time, amen. <clears throat> if you need an envelope, please raise your hands, and the ushers and hostesses will provide you an envelope. We have a few ways to give. You can text World Changers plus the amount to 74483. Call 1-866-477-7683, mail to 2500 Burdett Road, or you can go online to worldchangers.org or creflodollarministries.org. You all know the drill. Give out of your heart. Speak to God. Trust God in whatever you give today. Don't give grudgingly. Don't feel like you have to give. Let that be a continuation of your worship and your trust and relying on him. So as you've prepared your seeds, would you lift them up so we can bless it? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for these seeds sown. We thank you for having the opportunity to give into your kingdom, to continue our worship, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that there will be a sevenfold blessing or any blessing that you see, Father. For we give out of our hearts and not what we can receive, Lord, but you see it first. You see it all. And it's in Jesus' name and by his blood. Amen. Amen. Ushers, you may receive the offering. And as you give your offering, if you would stand as we get ready to dismiss. You know, sometimes it does get tough. We're, we're human and everybody goes through trials. But I'm pretty sure everyone here or everyone in the stream can think about a trial in your past that God did bring you through. And when you're having trouble where you are in your present, go back to your past and look at how he delivered you. And he can do the same thing again, amen? I think about, I was thinking about Peter and when he got out the boat. And Jesus was standing there, the glory was there. The storm didn't stop when he stepped out the boat. But God, well, Jesus was in the midst of that storm as well. And even when Peter slipped, Jesus was right there. He won't let you drown in the storm. The storm may keep going, but that glory is still there. Continue to focus on him. It gets tough. It gets depressing. It gets hard. And that, that spirit of suicide, I bind that. The enemy wants you to give in. He wants you to quit. He wants to make you feel inadequate. But you're a child of God. The Bible says life or death is in the power of the tongue. So no matter what it looks like, you speak life. You speak life unto yourself. When the devil gets in your mind of those, those evil thoughts, you bind it and you plead the blood. There's nothing stronger than the blood of Jesus. Amen. We have authority because he is in the power. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you thanking you today for allowing us to dwell together as a family. Lord, I pray for every world changer and everyone in this world, Lord, that your peace and your love may find them and comfort them, Father. We thank you for every trial that we go through because we know that we are just maturing and you are still there for us every step of the way. Thank you for sending your son, Lord, that we may have eternal life. 
Lord, I ask that everyone have safe travels home today and all families will be made well. Any brokenness, Lord, that you may fix it today. Suddenly, in the name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. Have a great evening, world changers. Join Creflo and Taffy Dollar for a three-day life-changing celebration, July 11th through 13th at World Changers Church International for our annual Grace Life Conference. We're kicking off this year's conference with inspirational singer and songwriter Doe Jones. General session times are 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Ministers and leaders don't miss the 5 p.m. just for you. Text Grace Life, one word, to 51555 and register today. 